The Land Rover Defender is more expensive than most of the cars I review. It is slow. It is massive, but it is awesome. And I'm gonna show you exactly why. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel so you can help me take this to the next level. Thank you. Now back to the review. The front of the Defender stayed the same for decades. Up until 2016, it looked like this, and this is a 1988 model. But don't let that make you believe that this thing hasn't seen changes throughout its whole lifespan. One more note, thank you Jared Mann and Chris Parentoni from Royal on the East Side for hooking me up with this Land Rover. Whether you're in the market for something new, used, or just plain cool, you should check them out. The Land Rover was originally designed in 1947 and was just referred to as the Series 1. The model I have here succeeded the Series 3 for the 1983 model year and was simply called the 90 or 110. While they have seen many different engine changes and upgrades throughout the years, they remained roughly the same until 2016 when sales ended globally. I'm just going to pretend the 2020 model doesn't exist. Now, this model is a restoration. The whole body itself, even back then, was made out of aluminum, which is pretty impressive. Uh, it also justifies some of its price. You have real vents. Since this model didn't have AC, most of this front end is metal, but there are some plastic bits like this grill. This design is extremely straightforward, and that carries over to the engine compartment. Under the hood lies a 2.5 liter diesel engine, the 200 TDI. So many engines exist for this thing. And you know, people put different engines in here. I'm sure people have LS swapped the thing. They throw in uh, Cummins bread truck engines. Uh, really, the options are pretty endless. Everything is fairly easy to reach. I mean, I've never seen a turbo just plopped right here. Like, there it is. And then they also added modern amenities like AC. Land Rover fanatics might recognize that the 200 TDI was first used in the Defender in 1990. However, the 19J 2.5 liter diesel turbo that came in the 88 model looks different from the engine in this truck. After some evaluation, I believe this was swapped with the 200 TDI, a common move since the 200 TDI is a more sought after engine than the 19J, which I'll get into more later. So the model that I have here is a Land Rover 90. The 90 stands for 90 inch wheelbase. You could get it in a 110 and a 130. The larger models came with four doors, pickup models were available, and there are plenty of custom configurations out there. This model has slightly oversized wheels, making it a little taller than the stock model, which was already 80 inches tall. 80 inches! And a truck with a 92 inch wheelbase. As you can see, the brake over here is crazy. The ground clearance is ridiculous. Oh man, why did I stain my pants? Oh fuck. If you're living in America, it's a little bit more difficult to get one of these things. So that's why models like this can go for 70 grand and 110s and 130s can go well above 100, even with higher mileage. Ugh. Other than feeling like a bus drill, this thing is a uh, Simple, again, large windows, visibility is endless, and also everything rattles. That'll come into factor later. Another thing I should note, the departure angle on here is like, I don't know, 70, 60 degrees. And you have like full metal bumpers here. Uh, this thing is a freaking tank. The exterior of the Defender 90 is straightforward, plain, and rugged just like the interior. Right away, it feels like the steering wheel should be on the other side in here. You actually have less space on this side due to the asymmetrical position of the transmission hump. But anyway, whenever you get past that, you see tons of manual controls uh, for just about everything. You have a very simple gauge cluster. The horn is in the best possible place. <laughs> 
your lights, you got like this nice, really satisfying switch. There's your brights. Everything has a very tactile feel. Land Rover is not known, uh, I guess, for longevity. But with the abundance of physical controls and lack of excess here, longevity is less of an issue. The materials used are rugged and inexpensive. Expect really no luxury quality or feel here. During its restoration, they added a actual head unit in here that gives you Apple CarPlay. Uh, you can modernize this thing. It has six speakers and a subwoofer. They also added lights, they added USB ports. I mean, these things are very customizable. There's a lot of aftermarket solutions to issues that have been presented. They also put leather upholstery in here and seat warmers. I won't spend too much more time here in the interior because most of them are probably gonna be different. Now let's hop into the back and show you what is up. This is technically a six seater. The excessive amount of windows makes this really uh, an interesting kind of fun experience. I mean, it's not comfortable at all. You're surrounded by metal. These cushions are just like removable and just the slightest bit of your ass will actually touch something in here. Um, so support is non-existent. In a pinch, you could fit some people and, and quite frankly, a decent amount of stuff back here. It's really tall too, so even with me being 6'3", I mean, I'm okay. Practical cargo holds aside, the more obvious bonus to Defender ownership would be its capabilities. Unfortunately, I couldn't do much in terms of off-roading with this one, but there are plenty of videos out there showcasing its prowess with standard permanent four-wheel drive, a low-speed transfer case, and a center locking differential. There are aftermarket ways to add front and rear axle lockers too, just like this one. On the road, this thing feels like a ponderous, unstoppable machine. This is powered by a 2.5 liter turbo diesel inline four, dubbed the 200 TDI. There was also the 300 TDI that was a little bit more sophisticated. This engine is a workhorse. Whenever you think about Land Rover, you usually don't think reliability. That is not the case here. Are they perfect? No, They're, some apparently suffer from head gasket issues. The 19J engine that came in this model originally was a turbo version of a trusty, powerless 2.5 liter diesel. When it came out in 86, it suffered some major issues. An update in 88 solved the big issues and many examples are still knocking down the road today. The most popular engines seem to be four cylinder turbo diesels from this point on, but there were five and six cylinder models as well as some small V8s available. The diesel turbo in 86 to 89 models had 85 horsepower and 150 torques. This car had the revolutionary 200 TDI with direct injection and 107 ponies spinning up 195 torques. Not bad for a low geared truck with a curb weight below 4,000 pounds. By the way, all of my sources are in the description. The transmission is a five speed manual as it should be. And may I say, this is one of the most surprising transmissions that I have ever driven. You'd think when driving something like this that the shifter would require some beating in order to actually function. You'd think maybe the throws would have to be pretty long, but that is not the case here. This thing is surprisingly easy to drive, or at least the transmission is. The clutch is pretty heavy. You can shift it, you know, I wouldn't say like a Honda, but you can still move through the gears. Your only issue is probably power. <laughs> in the spirit of automotive journalism and me being an American, we're gonna try to do a zero to 60. We're gonna be easy on her. All right, three, two, Come on, baby. That's a bad shift. A little slow. Come on, 50, 50, 55, 60. I've never felt so guilty about going 60 miles per hour in my life. Brake test. It's actually not as bad as I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
The four wheel discs on here are a common upgrade from the rear drums on this model year. Later years got them as standard and I definitely vouch for them. All Land Rover 90s and such from 1983 and on had a coil sprung suspension which makes the ride quality not too punishing. This rides better than an old YJ Jeep and they only got better as time went on. A few changes happened in 1990 when it officially became the Defender and it received the 200 TDI. The next biggest change was in 2007. The US can't get these models since they were discontinued here back in 1997, but if you have the money, you can put 2007 upgrades into your 1993 model, or you can wait for the 25 year import rule to take effect. Buying a newer model is the way to go if you can get a hold of one. What really makes this 88 model unrefined is the constant vibration from the engine. Everything in here seems to be rattling and there is no insulation in here whatsoever. It sounds like I've just been stuck inside the engine compartment of a school bus, but it feels so goddamn cool. Oh my gosh. I am just having a blast in here. Whether it's the transmission, which single-handedly raises your testosterone, or the sound of the engine just knocking away, this thing feels like an omnipotent beast. You, and you're sitting up comically high. I put this next to a JK Wrangler, which is uh, no sports car, and it was a good six inches higher than that thing, probably more. Even with its less than ideal specs, the Rover feels strong. The torquey engine and short gearing make it feel tireless through hills despite the lack of speed. The rough roads don't disturb it too much either. I can't imagine how authoritative it would feel off-road. Taking it around these corners, I'm pleasantly surprised again by the ride quality because this is a, a rougher road. Now the giant wheels are probably helping me here. Whenever you're cruising like 40, 35, it's happy as can be. And even when I was going 55, 60, the, the biggest issue there was really just the noise and the body. I think the engine and transmission felt like it wasn't falling apart. Now body roll is uh, not great. It's not so much of a body roll feeling, it's more of a feeling of like, shit, am I going to tip? The steering is not tight at all, but I have an okay idea of what the front wheels are doing, which is more than what I was expecting. We're doing about 50 now. Engine speed is about 1900 RPMs. I'm kind of having to shout right now. Now here comes a hill. There's no problem holding 50. Now, newer models are more civilized. Or at least that's what I've read. I haven't driven a newer one because this is like the third one that I've ever even seen. The newer models with the 2.4 liter diesel and the 2.2 liter diesel are apparently pretty reliable as well, or at least the engines are. Again, if you can, there are little downsides to buying a newer model. It seems like all Defenders reward the driver with a nostalgic, confidence-boosting experience. The diesel engine reassures you with torque. The view out of the lifted cabin is second to a select few. The immense feedback you get from the clutch and transmission is nothing short of satisfactory. And to top it off, it has a rugged look mixed with the innate upscale appearance associated with Land Rovers. These factors all work toward taking you to another place, mentally, when driving the Defender. This is a feeling I've gotten from driving other classic cars, but this one is the only one that simultaneously felt like a force of nature. And if that's what you want, a tough, unique, truly go anywhere workhorse, the Land Rover fits the bill. As an investment, it's great too. It won't really depreciate with mileage. There isn't much to break on them like normal Range Rovers and the engines are robust for the most part. Overall, I'd recommend the 90, 110, or Defender to anyone looking for a classic truck or just a fun and different daily driver utility vehicle. If you want something more posh, buy a G-Wagon. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the review, and I'll catch you in the next one. You're in third.